Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you to the Alma team for being here and for leading us in worship. Um, if you have children that are going down to Children's Church, they can dismiss um, out the back with Miss Melody. If your children are staying with us, there's activities on that back table that they can um, get and use throughout the service. Uh, there's a sermon notes designed for them with a little bingo game on it that they can play. Uh, those are all on that back table if they want to go uh, grab those. Um, so two weeks ago, we wrapped up our series on the life of David. And then last week, we uh, kind of entered a period where we're just going to look at some standalone uh, narratives and passages that teach us uh, the truth about who God is and how he cares for us and loves us. Uh, if you were with us last week, last week we looked at the story in Acts chapter 8 of Philip and the Ethiopian. And we talked about this incredible truth that God cares for and he pursues us as individuals. He doesn't just wait for us to figure life out and get our act together, but he pursues us with his love. And he often sends individual followers, you and I, as his messenger, message bearers. And that's exactly what God did in Acts chapter 8. He sent Philip some 165 miles into the desert to share his message of hope with the Ethiopian. And when he shares, the Ethiopian, for the first time, understands the love of God for him, understands who Jesus is, and he turns and follows after Jesus, and it changes his life. He's first baptized, and then he went, and he shared his newfound understanding, his hope, his forgiveness with all that he met. And then after service last week, we gathered and we celebrated lives changed within our own church. Um, over the past two weeks, we have heard the testimonies, the stories of God's pursuit and his life change in 15 different individuals through baptism. And when we do baptisms, we always ask those being baptized to share their story of faith. And in each of their stories, we heard of God's love, his pursuit of them and his love and his faithfulness to forgive. So these stories and these truths that we're studying in the Bible, they aren't just stories of the past, but they are stories of what God is still doing in lives today. God still pursues, he still saves, and he still gives purpose to our lives and to our futures. So last week we were in Acts chapter 8. Today we're going to kind of flip backwards. We're going to go to Acts chapter 3 if you would like to head in that direction. And in Acts chapter 3, we're going to see God heal. And in this healing, we're going to learn uh, four truths about who God is and how he loves us and what he promises over us. And so just a brief background before we start into Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, we are very early in the story of the church. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus appears to his followers and then he ascends back to heaven with a promise that he will one day return. But that, that when he leaves, he will send the church and his followers a helper in the form of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes and fills the followers of Jesus. And the disciples preach with boldness and courage. And all who are there in Jerusalem are able to understand them. And during that time, it says 3,000 believed and they committed to gathering and praying together. And so that's, that's the church when we get to Acts chapter 3. There's some 3,000 in number. They're trying to kind of figure things out with the help of the Holy Spirit. And they are committed to Jesus and sharing his hope with others. These men and women, they had seen Jesus. They had seen him die. They had, seen, they had buried him. And then they had seen him resurrected and alive again. Right? Dead people don't rise from the grave, but they had seen it with their own eyes, and their lives had been changed, and they were fully devoted to telling people about Jesus. And so that's kind of where we are when we get to Acts chapter 3. And so we're going to walk through this entire chapter together, starting in verse 1. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. It says, One day... Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And I love this detail because it's such an important detail. The early church, they recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the promised one in the Old Testament. They recognized that he was the Savior and that their Jewish friends were missing it. They recognized the issues with Judaism and the errors in their ways, and yet they continued to go back and reach out to their Jewish neighbors. The temptation would be to separate themselves from the Jews and isolate themselves. But they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the hope of the world and the hope of the Jews. And so they continued to go back and reach out to them. That's why they're at the temple, and we'll, we'll hear that in a second. But they are there to point their Jewish neighbors, friends, and family to Jesus and to salvation and forgiveness in him. The early church, and we see this throughout the book of Acts, they didn't bunker down and keep to themselves, but they constantly went back to their neighbors, family, and friends. In the same way, we as the church are not called to bunker down with other Christians, but we are called to constantly go back to our community and to our neighbors. J.D. Greer, he's got a book called Gaining by Losing, and he's got this quote that I love. He writes, without the mission, a church is not a church. It's just a group of disobedient Christians hanging out. Right? If we don't live with the Great Commission as our primary mission and focus, then we are missing it as a church. 
And yet, sadly, you look around, and that's the status of all too many churches. So many churches in the desire to meet their own needs or to protect themselves or in fear, they turn inward and they forget about their purpose and mission, which is to go and make disciples. As a church, we don't exist to meet our own wants and desires. We don't exist to just grow in knowledge that we will never use. We don't exist to be a comfortable place for Christians to gather. But instead, we exist to be a place that equips, encourages, and sends the church out to accomplish the mission of God. And that mission is to restore the world back to him through the gospel. And so that's what they're doing. They are living out the Great Commission here in verse 1. Verse 2, it says, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. So they're headed back to the temple, and they encounter this man who's been lame from birth. This man has never known what it felt like to walk, but instead we read that every day, every single day, he was placed at the temple gate, ironically called beautiful, to beg for money. There was no hope for this man. There was no hope of physical healing, no hope of spiritual healing, as he wasn't even allowed to enter the temple. Right? This man's lot in life is to sit on a corner and beg for money. That's all he could do, all he could ever hope for. Hope for. And as Peter and John approach, he begs them for money. If you read in the Greek, it's in the imperfect tense, which means he begged repeatedly. So he's not one of those like passive guys just holding the sign, but he is actively begging them for money. Verse 4 says, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Again, this is another just detail here, but it's such a beautiful detail. It says that Peter and John look at the man. What do we do when we see that annoying person at work or in school? What do we do when we see that person we don't like or that person at the corner at Walmart? Right? Do we look at them and see the person that God loves and created? Or do we stay focused on whatever we are doing and avoid eye contact at all cost? Right? That's not the response. It says they look straight at him. They see him. They see the need. They see the person. The reality is so often before we are afforded the opportunity to share the gospel, we must first see the person in need of the gospel. We must first care for the person. We must first love and value the person. And it's only then are we allowed the opportunity to share the hope of Jesus with them. God uses a lot of different methods to see the gospel shared, but more often than not, our stories, our testimonies begin with someone who noticed us, someone who cared enough about us to be a friend and share the hope of Jesus with us. Matthew 9, Jesus models this, and it says in verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. I love verse 36. It's when he saw the crowds, right? Our family, we call them unwashed masses. When he saw the unwashed masses, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In our lives, when we walk around the grocery store, our work, our school, our neighborhood, do we take time to notice those around us? Do we take time to hear their story, to to learn of their needs and genuinely care about them? Or are we so focused on us, our day, our needs, that we rush by without caring? So Peter and John, they first notice the man, and they make eye contact with him, and they make him look at them. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. So this beggar, what he he desired, he wanted money. He desired money. He desired the resources to meet his needs for the day. And Peter looks at him and says, silver or gold I do not have. This is a, an expression that meant I don't have wealth. He says, I don't have wealth, but what I do have is so much more. And in the power of Jesus' name, he calls on the man to get up and walk. And from there it says the man gets up and he walks away jumping and praising God. The man is healed immediately. His bones are healed. His muscles no longer are plagued with atrophy. But instead he walks and he jumps in new life. And that's what we're going to see that miracles always represent. They always represent new life. And we see Peter share that in his message. This man desired money, a meal that might satisfy for a moment, but God has given him a new lot, a new chance at life. The man, and we so often desire temporary satisfaction of a need or a want, but Jesus offers us new life and permanent satisfaction of our greatest need. Verse 9. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. 
And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Right? It said this man was there every day. He was known by the people. This isn't just some homeless drifter who stopped in town. He was someone they knew and interacted with regularly. And the man was healed, and he walks around praising God. And the people are amazed because they all recognize him as the beggar at the gate that they had seen day after day. This wasn't a miracle done in private, but a miracle that all recognized, and that brought glory to God. And as we'll soon see, it brought trouble for Peter and John. The other amazing thing about this miracle is that for the first time, this man would have been declared clean and able to walk into the temple. The man came seeking money. Peter healed him, giving him new life on earth. And eventually, we will read, it leads to his salvation and eternal healing. Right? How often is that our story, our testimony when we look back? We desired one thing, but God was orchestrating things, not for our temporary satisfaction, but for our eternal salvation. And from there, Peter uses this miracle, this opportunity to launch into, to share the gospel with these people. He uses this opportunity to, to offer healing and new life to any and all that would turn to him. We read that in the rest of the chapter, starting in verse 11. It says, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and faith that, that faith in the, the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, and you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this incredible story we find in Acts chapter 3. God, we thank you that when we read this story, God, we see how you have transformed our own lives. God, we see how you have used circumstances to draw us to you, Lord, and that we have experienced salvation in you. And God, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that is, that is in the, the place of this, uh, this beggar, Lord, that they may see how you are orchestrating their life to draw you, to draw you to God. And God, I pray that they might experience your forgiveness for the first time today. They might not be healed of, of their pain or healed of their economic suffering, God, but they can be hear, healed of their greatest need, which is their sin. And God, we pray that they might experience uh, eternal forgiveness and eternal satisfaction in you today. So God, I pray that as we walk through this, you would just speak to us, Lord, and that you would draw us closer to you. God, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. So as I studied this week, I read one commentator who, who broke down the miracles of Acts, and he concluded that every miracle in, Acts, in the book of Acts reveals four truths about who God is. And so we're going to kind of unpack those four truths today. And the first thing they, the, the, the miracles point to is that miracles point to the power of God and the identity of Jesus. And throughout the Bible, miracles point to the power of God. In the New Testament, they point to the power of God, and they point to the authentic authentication of who Jesus is as the Son of God. In Acts 3.15, we see Peter point to this. He says, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Miracles are God's validation of authority, first in the prophets and then in the life of Jesus, and then we see it in the apostles. The authors of Hebrews Hebrews in chapter 2 writes, This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And so 
miracles throughout the Old Testament, they pointed to the power of God. And here in the New Testament, they validate who Jesus is as the Son of God. They reveal his div- divine identity, an identity that calls for us to turn and worship him. Uh, one of the most famous miracles is in Matthew uh, chapter 14 when Jesus walks on the water. Their response is, of the disciples is found in verse 33. They say, truly, you are the Son of God. So miracles point to the power of God, and they authenticate who Jesus is as the Son of God. And we see Peter point to this in his sermon. Verse 16, he says, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. And so Peter says this miracle is proof to you that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. He is the promised Messiah. The miracle is not done for the glory of Peter or for the man, but instead it points the glory of Jesus and his power and identity as the Messiah. Peter then goes on and uses this as the foundation, as the the launching point to remind them of that they had just killed Jesus. He's quite clear, you killed Jesus, the Messiah. But he says there is still forgiveness and salvation for them in his name if they will turn and trust in him. He says Jesus has the power to heal, and as the Son of God, as the Messiah, he also has the authority and power to forgive sins and restore us to God. And so the question Peter asked the crowd and he asked us is, what do we do with that message? Do we believe that Jesus was a real person who was fully man and fully God, who died for our sins and came back to life? Do we believe that Jesus offers us salvation, love, and forgiveness? Or do we just think he's a good person or a myth that people use as a crutch? So we're asking the question, who do we believe Jesus is? And these miracles, they point and authenticate that he is the Son of God, able to forgive. And so we're left that question, do we know Jesus, and what have we done with this message? So Jesus, the Son of God, he has conquered death. He's worthy of your faith, your trust, your future. Have you trusted him? So that's the first thing. They authenticate who Jesus is. They reveal God's power. And the second thing that miracles in the book of Acts and this miracle does is it points us to future restoration. Tim Keller, who passed away just a few months ago and is now experiencing this future restoration, wrote, he wrote, miracles lead not simply to cognitive belief, but to worship, to awe and wonder. Jesus' miracles in particular were never magic tricks designed only to impress and coerce. Instead, he used miraculous power to heal the sick, feed the hungry, and raise the dead. Why, he asked. He said, we as modern people, we think of miracles as the suspension of the natural order. But Jesus meant them to be the restoration of the natural order. And so the promise of heaven, the promise of eternity is that we will one day experience no more pain, no more tears, no more disease, no more sickness, no more hurt, no more paralysis. And so miracles are the restoration of the natural order God created before sin entered the world and corrupted it. It is God's created natural order uncorrupted by sin that we look forward to. We see that in verse 21 when Peter says to the crowd that a time is coming when Jesus will return and God will restore everything just as he promised to the prophets. The miracle and the restoration of this man's health is just a foretaste of the restoration that is to come. Right? We know this. The Jews, they knew their Old Testament. They knew the prophecies. And they would have seen this miracle as a fulfillment of Isaiah 35, 6, which says, Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Verse 8, it says, he jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And so this miracle not only confirms who Jesus is, but it points us to Isaiah 35. And it serves as evidence of the restoration that is coming in Jesus. You can read all of Isaiah 35. It says, one day the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the oxen. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He continues, see, I will beckon to the nations, I will lift up my banner to the peoples, they will bring their sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. Then you will know that I am the Lord, and those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Isaiah in this miracle confirms that the future for the follower of Jesus is nothing but hope and restoration. And this miracle and the miracles in the book of Acts serve as a foretaste of what is to come in the future. Now just to clarify, does this mean that everyone who believes in Jesus will be healed and will experience nothing but happiness in this world, in this life? 
No. We know that's not true. Jesus told the disciples in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace because in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You think about Jerusalem on that day. There were a lot of sick and suffering there. But God chose to heal one. And so this is not the norm, but this is a sign of the restoration and healing that will one day be the norm and that it is coming when God will wipe away every tear and there will be no more pain or death. The promise of Jesus is that one day he will restore us completely, but in the meantime, he brings peace to our lives in the midst of struggle and the hope of what is to come. So sometimes God chooses to change our circumstances. Sometimes he doesn't. But when we trust in him, he promises to bring peace to our lives. The miracle of the apostles and Jesus were not just magic shows that showcase his power, but they were always an alleviation of suffering. One person I read this week describes this. They said Jesus' miracles did not just show off his raw power, but they always reveal the redemptive purpose of his power. So it's a reminder of what God is doing. Joni Erickson taught us, she's a famous uh, writer and Christian. She was paralyzed as a teenager in a diving accident. She broke her neck and was paralyzed from the neck down, and she wrote in her biography, at that great wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven, the first thing I'll be able to do on my resurrected legs is to drop down on grateful, glorified knees and kneel quietly before the feet of Jesus. She says, and then I'm going to get on my feet and I'm going to dance before him with all my might. And she concluded, can you imagine the hope, of the, resur- the hope the resurrection gives someone with an injury like me? That's the hope of the gospel and this miracle for the Christians, that one day we will be restored. One day we will be with our Savior with no more pain and no more tears. We will one day spend eternity with Jesus. So God's miracles, they illustrate his power. They authenticate who Jesus is. They are a foretaste of the, of the, of the restoration and healing that is coming. And then the next place the miracle points to is it points to our need for salvation, and it points us to the gospel. You see, the physical ailments of humanity point to the heart condition of us all. The physical sickness of our bodies point to the, the inward sickness and brokenness of our souls. And the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible tells us the wage or the penalty or the consequence for that sin is death and separation from God. Our, our, our sin has caused our souls to be crippled and disconnected from God. And so the physical depravity of the world and of our own lives is only a reminder of the depravity and the desperate situation of our souls without Jesus. You think about this man, he was economically poor, he was physically lame, and he was spiritually dead. At first he thought his greatest need was money, but Peter says to him, money I don't have. And instead of money, Peter gives him physical healing through the power of Jesus. He gives him new life on this earth, but even that isn't his greatest need. We find later in in Acts chapter 4, this guy experiences the true healing he needs because he becomes a follower of Jesus. Because you see, as bad as our physical suffering and our economic suffering might be, the Bible tells us there is something worse that we suffer from. The Bible says we are not just crippled by our sin, but the Bible says we are dead in our sin. In our sin, we are separated from God by the sin in our life. But the promise is there is something greater than physical healing available to all who will trust in Jesus. The Bible says there is soul restoration, new life available in him who gave his life on our behalf. I mean, you think about it, if Peter would have said, well, I don't have money and I can't physically heal you, but I can tell you this good news that if you trust in Jesus, your sins will be forgiven and you will have eternal life. If he would have said that, we might have think of that as less than or, or not nearly as amazing. But we know that's not true. We know that salvation of the soul and the promise of eternal life is greater than any temporary miracle. We know that. And this, this is offered to this guy through Jesus. This guy, he's sitting by the temple each day, and he was likely looking at everyone else, walking in and walking out. And he probably thought, if I could just walk, if I could just walk, I would never be unhappy again. Is that, is that a true statement, though? I think just about all of us walked in here today. But have we experienced unhappiness? Of course we have. Most of the world around us walks, but they are quite unhappy and unsatisfied. So just physical healing, just walking does not equate to happiness. This guy would have walked for a week, for a month, for a year, and then he would have experienced another disappointment, and he would have been unhappy again. Like, that's all of us. We all have those things in our life that we think would make us happy. We think if I just had a better job or a better schedule or a spouse or a child or a new house, if I had my health back, if I could walk, if I had more money, if my team finally won a championship, 
Whatever it is, we think if we had that thing, it would make us happy. But there is re- the reality is there are people all over this world with that thing we think would make us happy, and yet they're not satisfied. We talked about it at camp this week, but our idols, our pursuits on earth, the, 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 the pastor there said they leave us fragile. Those things, they will either let us down and leave us disappointed, or we may get them one day and find that they are empty and have left us unsatisfied. Because all of us, including this man, we need something more than physical healing. We need something more than money. We need something more than a new relationship. We need to be restored and made alive in Jesus. And the reality is, from an eternal perspective, physical healing, a new relationship, a larger paycheck, it means nothing without soul restoration in Jesus. And for many of you that are followers, your testimony, your story begins with a physical limitation, a a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, a difficult challenge or circumstance in your life that God used to bring you to him. God used a difficulty, a challenge that he could have healed in an instant to instead draw you to him and give you eternal life and life abundant in him. A crisis, a challenge you didn't want in the moment, but because of the salvation you've experienced, you wouldn't give back for anything. And so whatever the pain you are going through, the greatest thing that can happen to you is reconciliation and new life in Jesus. This man believed it was money he needed. This man believed it was walking that would make him happy. And he experienced both of those things, but it was restoration and new life in Jesus that would ultimately satisfy him. And that is satisfying him to this day. So this miracle authenticates who Jesus is. It points to the future restoration that we will experience. It points to our need for salvation and restoration in Jesus. And and then lastly, this miracle and the miracles in the book of Acts, they point us always to the mission of God. The call for every believer is to share the hope of Jesus and point people to the one who saves and satisfies. Again, we talked about it. If you fast forward to, to Acts chapter 4 for just a second, we see that this miracle didn't just result in physical healing, but it resulted in the advancement of the mission and many coming to faith in Jesus. It says, because of this miracle and Peter's boldness to proclaim the gospel, many came to faith and the number grew from 3,000 to 5,000. This miracle of the lame man led to the advancement of God's mission. The boldness of Peter and John to share the hope of the gospel led to the advancement of God's mission. And so while we celebrate the miracle and we celebrate the boldness of Peter or John, we celebrate that thousands came to faith, there's this one troubling reality in this story, and that is that Peter and John are not rewarded on earth for their faithfulness. They're going to be persecuted and thrown in prison for this miracle. And that is the pattern we see with miracles. It's the pattern we see in Jesus' life. It's the pattern we see in the mission of God. And it's what theologians, they have a fancy word for this. They use for Jesus on the cross and for when we give of ourselves. It's called substitution. And that's when one voluntary suffers so that another one can live or prosper. It's what Jesus did on the cross when he gave his life, when he took the penalty of death that our sin deserved. He's died so that we didn't have to and so we could have life in him. And so in this story, the man gets to walk. Thousands are saved and Peter and John go to jail. And the call on the church is to embrace the mission of God and to give of ourselves so that others might know him. The call on the church is to give of their money, their time, their comfort, their preferences so that the, they can be witnesses to the world. The Bible tells us the mission of God is so important that the church, that us as Christians are called to sacrifice so that others can experience life, hope, and a future in him. Jenny Greer said it like this, and I love this. He said, the healing of the world comes through the sacrificial death of the church. The healing of the world comes through the sacrificial death of the church. Are we as Christians in the church willing to sacrifice for the sake of others? Are we willing to sacrifice our desires, our preferences, our wants, even our needs, so that others might know the love and hope and life of Jesus? Are we willing when we talked about it in that very beginning, that a church without the mission is nothing. Are we willing to give of ourselves for others, or would we rather be comfortable? Would we rather risk nothing and allow the world to perish without ever hearing and experiencing the tangible love of Jesus? The call and the mission of the church to share Jesus with the world isn't a call that brings glory upon the church and us as Christians, but instead it's a call to, uh, to give, uh, for us to give of our lives to give of our glory, to give of our riches, to give of our comfort so that others might know him and so that God might be glorified.
The mission of God is never going to bring us glory. It likely is never going to bring us comfort or riches, but it will bring life to others and glory to God, the one that is worthy. That's what I love about VBS. We have a beautiful opportunity to live this out this week. Many of you are going to give of your time, to give of your comfort, to give of your energy, to give of your sleep so that others can hear the hope of Jesus this week. And so this week, remember when you are tired and when you are cranky and when you are fed up with that annoying kid in the corner that won't stop talking, that God is worthy. He is worth it. And he has the power to save and transform that child's life just like he has transformed and saved your life. But these opportunities, they go beyond one week. God is calling us daily to give of ourselves so that others might live. Today, there's some of you that God is calling you to change your priorities, to step out of your comfort zone, to just notice those around you, to serve others in the name of Jesus, to give to others or to give and to help, to take a step of obedience, not so that your life will be easier, but so that someone else might know the love and hope of Jesus. And the, the gospel, the book of Acts, the Bible declares to us the mission is worth it. The call is to live our lives for Jesus and to value others above ourselves. The church, as we saw earlier, we don't exist to gather to meet our preferences. We don't exist to bring glory to ourselves and to grow for our own benefit. But we gather together to be reminded of who we are in Jesus, to be reminded of the importance of the mission, and to be sent out empowered to live our lives for Jesus and to give our lives so that others might know him. And so as we conclude, the worship team, they're going to come and they're going to lead us in a final song. And I'm going to stop talking. Um, but as they come, I just want to give us a moment to reflect. As we think about this story, where do we find ourselves and what is God calling us to? First of all, it's quite possible you might be here and you might be the beggar and you might be feeling like you are in need of something financially or healing or something like that. You might not yet know Jesus, your Lord and Savior. And if that's you, what is he using in your life? Can you look at your life and how is he drawing you to him? As Peter said, if you will turn and you will follow him, you will experience forgiveness of your sins. Or maybe you're here and you are the believer and God is calling you to step out of your comfort zone and to sacrifice and to live for others. Who is he calling you this week to see, to love, to care for, to share the hope of Jesus with? You may not be able to physically heal, but you have the words of eternal life in you. Who is God calling to sh you to show, your show his love to and share that hope with. So I'm going to pray for us, and then after I pray, they're going to lead us in song, and we'll just spend a few moments reflecting. Dear Lord, we thank you for who you are. God, that we think that you are powerful, and that you have the power to heal. God, we thank you that you have sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place, that we can be forgiven. We thank you that if we turn and follow after you, we can confidently know that our sins are forgiven, and we will one day spend eternity with you in heaven where restoration will be fulfilled, where there will be no more hurting and crying and no more tears and no more disabilities, God, that we will be made new in you. So God, I pray if there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that hasn't experienced that forgiveness, Lord, you would call them today. And God, I pray for us as believers, as the church. God, I pray that you would help us to, to see the worth of who you are. God, that we would see how you have healed us from our sins, how you have saved us from our sins. That we would know the reality of heaven that awaits for us. And as we live in that reality, Lord, that we would give of ourselves, that we would give of our desires and our wants and our needs, that we would give up our fears in order to follow you and to show your love and to share your love with those around us. God, we pray that our community and our neighbors and our families' lives would be transformed as they see you in us. God, we pray that you would use us to share your hope with the world around us. God, we thank you that you have given our lives purpose and mission. May we live for you and not for us. So God, we pray in these next few moments, Lord, that you would just speak over our lives and that you would call us to deeper faith in you. Lord, we love you. And we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.